not have evolved as human beings had we not had an active emergency response system within us. Fight or flight, an essential part of our survival instinct. That comes from what has been called our reptilian brain, our first brain, the one that's most deeply embedded in our craniums. And it's essential. We wouldn't be here without it, but it's not sufficient if we want to be fully human. Over the eons, we have developed other ways of perceiving, deciding, and acting, and different layers of our brain matter. I won't get into all the biology, but that's what makes us uniquely human. The prefrontal cortex, some say, is the sacred area of our brain that enables us to think of things sacred, to transcend ourselves, to know that we're going to die, to decide how we want to live, and not to just be run by our instincts. But when our reptilian brain hijacks the rest, trouble is sure to follow. People who get stuck in their reptilian brain because of anxiety, fear, or whatever, are almost always at war with someone. One time I had somebody come and ask for some help. And I was, it was a weak moment kind of thing, and I gave the person cash, which I shouldn't have done, and after it was over, I said, I blew it. So I went to the police. I spoke to Chief Mern, who was chief at the time, and I said, this is what happened, this is what I know, I don't know much. He said, we'll get on it. They got on it, they found the guy, he was a professional shyster, you know, so I didn't feel so bad. It wasn't like he was an amateur just starting out, he was good. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> but I said to the chief, I said, you know, I feel so stupid. And he said, look, Jeff, I'm in the business of suspecting people. You're in the business of trusting people. We need each other. 
that neat sort of a balance. So he took some of the heat off me. And he was telling me, I need your perspective too. Jesus knew all of this all too well. So his parables and teachings are brilliant examples of him trying hard to penetrate our well-enforced walls around ourself. Very sophisticated self-protection systems because he wanted to get inside our hearts. In order what? To have control? No. In order to save us from ourselves. Today's parable about walking, in the middle of all that, there was just a little phrase, if someone asks you to go a mile, go another. It doesn't say much about the context, but that's a great example, and I want to tell you a little bit about it. As a Jew, Jesus lived in a potentially very violent world. When there was disruption, Rome came down hard. Jesus and the two thieves were not the first to be crucified and not the last. The streets would be lined with crucified people sometimes if there had been an uprising. They were saying, watch out. You want to fool around with us? We'll take care of you. And don't forget. Rome brought, brought peace. They brought roads. They brought education, cultural expansion all through their empire. But they dealt harshly with dissidents, with heretics, prophets. They ruled with an iron hand, peace, but with a price. It was legal, for example, for a Roman soldier to stop anyone beneath them in the pecking order, and the lowly Jews were at the very bottom of the ladder, and to force them to carry their armor for a mile, but only for a mile. The armor weighed in around 60 pounds, so this wasn't an easy task. Not only did it take you out of your way, it was a tough workout. And it created a lot of resentment, as all occupying powers will do. I'm sure that the soldiers weren't particularly gracious. You know, they didn't pat the Jew on the back and say, thanks, I appreciate your help. It was an act of personal power. And the Jew was reminded that in this system, he had very little indeed. And I'm also sure that, you know, he, he didn't come away feeling like I made a new friend. So what did Jesus suggest? Civil disobedience? No. Guerrilla warfare, throw stones at all the Roman centurions and soldiers you see from a safe distance? No. He said, offer to take the armor another mile. What? <laughs> That's like rubbing salt into the wound. That's no way to restore dignity. Or is it? Look at this through the lens of Jesus' intentions. The Jew carries the armor cheerfully for the first mile. At the end, the soldier knows the rules. He can't force him to go. And if he breaks that rule, he will be punished. And it won't be easy. But this foolish Jew insists. Oh, no, I insist. I'll take, I'll take your armor another mile. Now, the soldier's suspicious. This doesn't feel right. How does he punish this Jew for disobeying him when he says, give me back my armor? I mean, the guy's trying to carry his armor another mile for crying out loud. What if it's a trap? What if the Jew does this and then complains about the second mile and said, why would I do this on my own? He made me do it. So the soldier wants none of that. But the Jew is so willing, so cheerful in Jesus' mind. And so the soldier gives in. Notice what has happened. The lowly Jew has taken his power back. You can't make me do this, but I can choose to do it. When Jesus was on trial at the end of his life, he said to the authorities, you don't take my life, I give it. Very different, very different indeed. Yes, he has to walk the extra mile with heavy armor, but Jesus is saying that's a small price to pay for one's dignity and freedom. And the situation becomes diffused. Who would have thought that cheerful nonviolence could be so powerful and so confrontative and so dangerous to a system of law and rules? We saw it in the civil rights movement in spades. Without landing a blow or shedding any blood at all, the Jew could take back his, his power. Rome understood the love of power 
Jesus understood the power of love, and these two continued to collide. Secondly, we're all familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. We love to have it acted out by our young people. We're so familiar with it, sometimes we, we miss some of the implications. Because it's hard for us to imagine just how confrontational this was to the hearers in Jesus' day who first heard it. This hated Samaritan, considered a bitter enemy of the Jews universally, is the hero of the story? See, but this hero stands out because he sees his bitter enemy, the Jewish man wounded, that he's first and foremost his brother. That takes a lot. This kind of love has to start with someone who's willing to break the chain, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. You know, it's interesting. An eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth was seen as an improvement because in those days, Somebody takes your eye, you cut off his head. Or if they kill your brother, you kill their family. It was like it expanded. And this was say, let's be reasonable. Let's be fair. Jesus is saying the concept is wrong. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I say, pray for your enemies and those who persecute you. And they'd say, what? And I ask, what are we looking for when we see others who are different? from us? What are we perceiving? What are we programmed to see? George Zimmerman had a job to do. He was paid to protect the gated community from unwanted intruders. He knew the stereotypes of what trouble often looked like. And what Trayvon Martin saw and said and did on that tragic night, February 2012, is in question because he isn't here to tell us. We don't know his side of the story. See, that's a bad start. It often leads to distance, fear, and in this case, sometimes death. Jesus wasn't telling clever stories that we remember in order to entertain us, but to save us from our blindness. Reverend Steve Garnus Holmes' comments on the George Zimmerman verdict, quote, our community does not need to be protected so much as it needs to be healed. The only path to justice, justice is not a verdict at all, but the practice of learning to see people as people rather than primarily as threats or as one of them. We need to go about in a different kind of neighborhood watch program. We need to see people first as neighbors and keep an eye on our own neighborhood. And what he means by that is our behavior as neighbors. We look for opportunities to bless people then and to heal communities, looking for ways to breach the boundaries that have been placed between us and them. Jesus was into removing those boundaries. And he picked lightning bolt, raw nerve examples that would get their attention. We need to look for places where the neighborhood is threatened by exclusion, prejudice, dehumanization. When we see one of them, we need to ask, how can I help to restore this person to wider community? Or what do I need to help me to open my heart to see this person as a full member of Christ's community, just like I want to be seen? The path to justice Pastor Steve finishes, the path to justice is befriending the stranger, loving the enemy, living nonviolently. There's no other way. Does that sound a bit naive? Yes, there are people out there who intend to hurt or to rob. We have to be careful. We have to use our common sense. But there are many, many more people out there, perfect strangers, who don't mean any harm at all. And in the world that Jesus is promoting, Trayvon Martin should be alive and starting his school year along with his friends. A very mild example from my adolescence. Some of you might remember this, but way back in the 60s, 
Madras became popular. If you wore a Madras tie or some guy had a Madras sports jacket, that was like you walked in the room, you almost need sunglasses. Whew. But I had a Madras belt. And I was invited to a cookout over at my cousin Jim's house. Jim was the tough guy. That was my cousin. And of course, I'm wearing my typical summer garb, button-down shirt, chino slacks, Madras belt. Jim was there, all dressed in black, hair slicked back. He wouldn't have been caught dead in Madras, and he's looking at me and I'm looking at him. I was referred to disdainfully as a college. You know, you're going to college and you're in the privilege. And Jimmy was a rat. He wound up going into the military. College wasn't for him, changed later. He showed me the scars from his gang initiation. And of course, I'm looking for a way to go lock myself in the car. We looked at each other from across this huge gulf. And I felt in my heart that if I'd been walking down the street at night alone and I ran into a group of Jimmy's friends, I would have been afraid that they were going to try to beat me up because I was wearing the symbols of an opposing group without knowing it. But neither of us knew that our point of view was so limited and so temporary. Jim and I lived long enough to see more deeply into the richness of our kinship and our bonds being children of God together, and the love that bound us closely together. When I presided at his funeral in January, I was so grateful that our relationship didn't end when we were both so blinded by our peers and our fears. Jesus knew that our blindness is deadly. Jesus' stories were very provocative to his listeners' ears. But how else could he get their attention? How else can he get ours? If Jesus could expect his listeners to love their perceived enemies back then, he expects it still. Sure, it's hard. I don't know anybody who finds it easy. And it doesn't have primarily to do with them, whoever they are, but with us and how we see and how we perceive. If you're looking for an enemy, you'll find one. If you're looking for a fight, you'll get one. But if instead you're looking for a brother or sister in the face of a stranger, the kingdom of God can take a big step forward. Tragic endings aren't inevitable. Amen.